on this Monday night declined. Some people are turning away Moderna's COVID shot. What's behind the injection rejection? Moderna is a very good vaccine. The dose is in danger of being dumped in Canada, while the U.S. records an onslaught in new cases. Nothing but turbulence. The SOS from the troubled travel agency industry. Invasion of grasshoppers. They will all die and you'll see it's like a graveyard of grasshoppers. But within 36 hours, thousands more have come back. An Alberta city gets bugged big time. And going for women's soccer gold at the Olympics, Canada kicks the U.S. out of contention. Global National with Donna Friesen. Reporting tonight, Farah Nasser. Good evening and thank you for joining us on this August long weekend, which signals the last stretch of summer. And while the pandemic may not be top of mind for many Canadians enjoying their time off, Health experts say what we do right now is going to determine what we face this fall. New data shows we are at the start of a fourth wave driven by the highly transmissible Delta variant. Canada's top doctor says this country needs to raise its vaccination firewall to better protect for this fall. Canada has received more than 66 million COVID-19 vaccine doses, enough to fully immunize every eligible person in this country. But the number of people getting their first dose in recent weeks has stalled at 81 percent. There is still a lot of vaccine hesitancy. And now pharmacists in Ontario are warning thousands of Moderna doses could go to waste because people aren't showing up for their shots. The reason? Brand preference. Sean O'Shea has our top story. In Canada's largest city and most populous province, the question of vaccine supply and demand has been turned upside down. I think it's ridiculous. Only weeks ago, getting an appointment for a dose of COVID-19 vaccine was a little like winning a lottery. Now, over uh, several thousand are set to expire on August 6th, and that's because of the 30-day window. Vaccine doses destined to be tossed out. Wasting them and having to throw them away because they've expired is really one of those things that we don't want to see happen. Canada is awash in vaccine supply. The problem, a decline in those wanting shots, and now a growing consumer brand preference. People are turning away uh, when they find out it's Moderna or not showing up. It's not so much that Moderna has a bad name, it's just that Pfizer has really dominated the market in mRNA vaccines. Pharmacists say some customers are worried that mixing and matching, having two different types of vaccines, will limit their travel opportunities. They're seeing people turned away from cruise lines or certain Caribbean destinations, and that could also be contributing to some of the hesitancy around Moderna. I just don't understand why they don't uh, like uh, the Moderna. The fact that we're seeing vaccines getting wasted, it's a pity. With only a billion of seven billion vaccinated around the world so far, this woman who's had one dose of each says it's wrong. I've immigrated here from Pakistan. People are dying there and they don't have access to Moderna. I have a Moderna and a Pfizer and, you know, I'm happy to be fully vaccinated at this moment. How to avoid waste? We should be right now talking to uh, other countries to say, what do you need? What can we help with? Can we donate? Not practical for supplies expiring this week, say pharmacists. Their association has asked the Ontario government to authorize a third booster shot rather than throw out the doses. Elderly, senior folks, um, those that are in high-risk populations. And for those still on the fence... That Moderna is a very good vaccine. It's equally as good as the Pfizer vaccine. There's no real difference. Sean O'Shea, Global News, Toronto. The U.S. is facing a similar vaccine problem. Too much supply and not nearly enough demand. Vaccination sites are sitting empty as hospitals fill up due to soaring cases driven again by the Delta variant. In Florida, there are now more people hospitalized than any other point in the pandemic. And as Jackson Prosco reports, America's top doctors warn things are about to get worse. At a weekend fair near St. Louis, a pop-up vaccination clinic sat empty for two whole days. In a state with one of the lowest rates of vaccination and highest rates of new COVID cases, not a single person walked through the doors. I am surprised by that. I wish more people would get vaccinated. Your grandma and grandpa seem fine. Down the road in Branson, Missouri, Billy Barker and six-year-old Brody now wait anxiously outside a hospital window. 31-year-old Daryl Barker is on the other side of the glass, battling severe COVID and strong regret. I was strongly against getting the vaccine, just because we're a strong conservative family. Uh, 
but that little boy out there is a reason to have a vaccine. As the virus rips its way through the nearly 100 million Americans who are still unvaccinated, a dangerous fourth wave is growing rapidly, driven by the Delta variant. The numbers that we're seeing are are unbelievable. They're just unbelievably frightening. Incredibly, there are now more COVID patients in Florida hospitals than at any prior point in the pandemic, surpassing records set before vaccines were available. 100% of the people in my ICU in the intensive care unit are unvaccinated. The strong uptick in cases and hospitalizations has prompted some renewed interest in immunization. 70% of adult Americans are now at least partially vaccinated, a milestone reached one month later than expected. Americans are seeing the risk and impact of being unvaccinated and responding with action. But vaccine uptake remains uneven, giving the virus and its more virulent strain plenty of places to spread unchecked. Across the U.S., the places with the lowest rates of vaccine acceptance are on track to experience their worst days yet. Jackson Prosco, Global News, Washington. Another major health concern in this country is the smoke from wildfires. Environment Canada has issued an air quality advisory for Metro Vancouver and the Fraser Valley due to smoke from fires in the province's interior and neighboring Washington state. The haze is expected to blanket the region for the next day or two, with more than 240 fires burning throughout B.C. Many areas are already dealing with thick smoke. The air quality is also a concern in parts of western Ontario, Manitoba and Saskatchewan. All four provinces are experiencing an above average number of wildfires this season as climate change intensifies hot, dry conditions. To the Tokyo Games now and a historic win in soccer. For the first time ever, Canada will play in the Olympic gold medal game for women's soccer. The team upset the number one ranked U.S. for its first win against the Americans since 2001. Now, the Canada-U.S. rivalry has deep roots, with the U.S. winning most of the matches. But as Crystal Gamansing reports, it was Canada's turn for a dramatic victory. Jesse Fleming likes the motto, play every game like it's your last. If this was the 23-year-old's final soccer moment, it was a player's dream come true. The Americans are a force on the pitch, having won four gold medals in the last six Summer Olympics. But that one goal by Fleming was enough to take the game. A victory that made former teammate Kaylin Kyle emotional. They put blood, sweat and tears into this. So I've been there and I knew how much it meant for the bronze medal. I can't even imagine being in a gold medal final. Um, so I'm like, again, I wouldn't have missed the game for the world. Team captain Christine Sinclair is the world's leading goal scorer with 187 goals in international play. But she handed the ball to Fleming. Maybe she knew Fleming's foot was still hot after scoring a penalty shot against Brazil to help get Canada to the semifinals. And Jessie's young, but she's an experienced player. But Sink knows the program is going to need players like her to step up when Sink's not there anymore. Head coach Bev Priestman has said all along they were looking to change the color of their medals. One, two, three, we yeah. The Canadians have two bronze medals from back-to-back -back Olympics. On our day, this team can, can go all the way. That's what I, gen I genuinely feel that. I think we have to show up to every game to do that, and it, it is difficult. Nobody, I keep saying to the players, nobody's going to hand us a medal. Getting by Sweden won't be easy, but no matter what, the Canadians have upgraded their medal. Should they win gold, it will be historic. The match goes Friday at 11 a.m. in Japan. That's 10 p.m. Eastern Thursday night in Canada. Crystal Gamansing, Global News, London. And that gold medal game will make history for Canada for another reason. 25-year-old midfielder Quinn will become the first openly transgender and non-binary athlete to win an Olympic medal. They came out publicly as transgender in a social media post last fall, saying they want to be visible to queer folks who don't see people like them on their feed. 
And weightlifter Laurel Hubbard has made her mark at the Games. She is the first openly transgender woman to compete in an Olympic weightlifting final. Despite being a medal contender, she could not complete a lift. A medal is now out of reach for the New Zealander in the women's over 87 kilogram division. Hubbard thanked her supporters for their love and encouragement and the IOC for being inclusive. Two medal hopefuls who withdrew from Olympic events last week are participating in Tuesday's women's balance beam final. Canadian Ellie Black and American Simone Biles are scheduled to compete for a medal. Black pulled out from the all-around final after spraining her left ankle in training. Biles, the star of the gymnastics team, stepped away from competition to focus on her mental health. She missed five events. The International Olympic Committee is investigating the gesture a U.S. athlete made on the podium after receiving her silver medal. Shot putter Raven Saunders raised her arms in an X, a potential breach of rules banning protests on metal podiums. Saunders says the gesture represents solidarity with people who are black, LGBTQ2, and who have struggled with mental health. She says American athletes have been planning to protest for several weeks. The IOC has not specified what penalties a violation might occur. The U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee says the gesture did not breach its rules. The Polish government has granted a humanitarian visa to an Olympic sprinter from Belarus. Kristina Timonovskaya feared for her safety after criticizing her coaching staff for entering her into an event she wasn't prepared for. Now, this comes nearly a year after the country's disputed election. And as Redmond Shannon reports, since then, Belarusian authorities have detained and allegedly tortured government critics. Kristina Timonovskaya should have been racing for Belarus in the 200 metres on Monday. Instead, she was seeking refuge from her own government. On Sunday, the sprinter said team bosses drove her to the airport to board a flight home. That after she criticised coaches for entering her into the 4x400 metre relay at the last minute, an event she'd never even raced before. Japanese police guarded Timonovskaya at a hotel and then brought her to the Polish embassy Monday where she was offered a humanitarian visa. She's at the Polish uh, uh, embassy, um, uh, safe uh, uh, and in a, a quite good condition, uh, although the whole situation had a quite negative footprint on her. Other Belarusian athletes have previously been fined, sacked or jailed for speaking out against the government of authoritarian leader Alexander Lukashenko. The IOC has refused to recognize the president's son as head of the Belarusian Olympic Committee. In the past year we've taken quite a lot of action against the Belarusian NOC, um, so we need to look at what they tell us and try to get a, an idea of what's, what's been going on. The team's head coach said that Timonovskaya's behavior was erratic. Belarusian state TV called her actions a cheap stunt. Her husband has already fled to Ukraine. It was very dangerous for her because she understands uh, uh, they are under pressure and it was very dangerous for her in Minsk. What may have started as a sporting spat has now quickly moved into the sphere of geopolitics on the most high profile of stages. And it again highlights the atmosphere of repression and intimidation in Belarus following last year's widely disputed election. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. The pandemic spelled the departure of hundreds of travel agencies. Coming up, the help the struggling industry is now pleading for. As more Canadians get vaccinated and more restrictions ease, travel is making a big comeback in this country and around the world. But for one tourism industry, it could be too late. Travel agencies have suffered many financial setbacks in this pandemic. And as Karen Lieberman reports, many might not survive much longer without Ottawa's help. Canada's tourism industry is ready for takeoff, with travel being booked or rebooked after COVID-19 first crushed plans and shut down borders. So our company had 10,000 cancellations. Leaving travel agents like Richard Vanderloop scrambling. The rebookings and the cancellations and the rebookings, and then ultimately the winter vacations being terminated altogether. 
And now we're going through the third or fourth wave of this, which is now the refunds. Travel may be making a slow comeback, but the damage has been done for travel agencies. Vanderloop closed all 25 of his storefront locations. Staff now work remotely. Across Canada, more than 800 storefront agencies are now permanently closed. The Association of Canadian Travel Agencies, or ACTA, estimates the industry's agencies and agents are still seeing a revenue decline of 95 percent. The last uh, 16 months have absolutely been devastating. ACTA is calling on Ottawa to extend financial support until the end of 2021. So far, multiple COVID-19 benefits will last through much of October. So today, I'm announcing that we are extending the wage and rent subsidies and lockdown support until October 23rd of this fall. A much-needed lifeline, because while travel agents may have been busy throughout the pandemic, cancelling or rescheduling, they weren't actually earning any income. Travel agents aren't actually paid until people leave. And so there's no income whatsoever until at least later this year and into 2022. So it's tough times. And so I'll expect more closures. As vaccination rates increase and Canadians feel more confident making plans, the future for travel is bright for those agencies that survive. Travel is a pent up demand. People have been dreaming about it. We just need help to get to the end of 2021. Karen Lieberman, Global News, Toronto. Capelin conundrum ahead, the crisis over a small fish with a big impact on the East Coast. You're watching Global National. A fishery in Newfoundland and Labrador is facing big problems over a small species important to the ocean's food chain. Capelin may not be as lucrative as crab or lobster, but they're still worth millions to the province's harvesters. As Ross Lord explains, their numbers are nearing extinction, and that could lead to a devastating domino effect. The Capelin fishery in Newfoundland and Labrador is small, but important. It's open for one week per year, just as the Capelin prepare to lay their eggs, often on the shoreline. Look at them all! At sea, fish harvesters scoop up 20,000 metric tons a year worth several million dollars, egg-bearing females exported to Japan for sushi. But Capelin stocks are low, just 4% of where they were in the 1980s. And there are calls to shut down the fishery before they're totally depleted. From a WWF standpoint, we are calling for a total halt of the fishery. The reasoning? Capelin are the main food source for cod, which were the lifeblood of Newfoundland and Labrador before they were overfished and the commercial cod fishery shut down 30 years ago. This wildlife biologist suggests without Capelin, there's no comeback for cod. It's supporting our cod stocks. And, you know, I, I would look at the termination of the Capelin fishery, or at least a suspension, as an investment in our cod stocks. This Department of Fisheries and Oceans scientist says she shares those concerns, but decisions on fish quotas fall to the fisheries management branch of the department. We, we just provide the advice. We're not involved in the final decision making. She says it's possible Capelin are being depleted more by things like ice patterns, ocean temperatures and salt content. The theory endorsed by the Union for Fish Harvesters, which brushes off critics. The small harvest that's important to uh, rural and coastal Newfoundland and Labrador is extremely small and they uh, should know if they don't that that's not having uh, an impact on the stock whatsoever. DFO has cut the Capelin quota by 25 percent this year, a measure the World Wildlife Fund says is not enough and the Fish Union says is too much. Ross Lord, Global News. Creepy crawly crisis next, why grasshoppers are invading parts of southern Alberta. First, it was the pandemic, then extreme weather disasters. Now, it's grasshoppers. Hordes have invaded Lethbridge, Alberta, following weeks of hot and dry conditions. They're ravaging crops, they're terrifying residents, and they're multiplying beyond control. Grasshoppers have swarmed the region before, but as Heather Yorks West explains, it has never been like this. And there are fears the worst is still to come. 
It's a sound that residents of this West Lethbridge neighborhood can't seem to escape. The hop, hop, hop of grasshoppers by the thousands. A constant presence in Paige Thornborough's yard now since early June. In order for everyone to actually want to eat, we've had to just, you know, close our blinds. We'll put on music so we can't hear them because it's just, it's disgusting. The swarming grasshoppers have kept Thornborough's young daughters from playing in the backyard all summer. For Crystal Earl's family, the infestation is very much the same. My husband, he's sprayed the yard twice now, and they'll, they will all die, and you'll see it's like a graveyard of grasshoppers, but within 36 hours, thousands more have come back. They're big. Yeah, they are big. Dan Johnson has studied the grasshopper population in southern Alberta for years. When they began hatching in early June, I was seeing 20 per square meter, which is already concerning. By July 5th, I was seeing places with 100, 150 per square meter, which is way past the level of crop damage. Johnson says the hot weather and drought conditions has caused the grasshopper population to explode. The situation we're, we're feeling right now is more of a result of the drought, uh, which is drying up the agricultural crops around the city. So the grasshoppers are moving into the city more than they typically would. But as bad as things are this season, because all these grasshoppers are now laying eggs for next year, summer 2022 could actually be even worse. The city says it doesn't usually control for grasshoppers, but with climate change making Canadian summers hotter and drier, the Parks Department is now looking into what can be done. If it's going to just, you know, get worse next year and potentially worse the year after that, I think we need to have some serious conversations in our family about, you know, is it worth, um, is it worth it being here still? The hordes of hoppers turning what should be a backyard oasis into a seemingly never-ending nightmare. Heather Urex West, Global News, Lethbridge, Alberta. Even through the TV, it's enough to make your skin crawl. That is Global National for this Monday. I'm Farah Nasser. Thank you so much for spending part of your evening with us. Tonight's Your Canada is a much nicer sight than that backyard in Lethbridge. This is Kootenai Lake in British Columbia. We love seeing Your Canada, so please email us your pictures at viewers at globalnational.com. Until tomorrow, take care of yourselves and each other.